everybody. Welcome to the first plenary. Before we do the first plenary, we're going to uh, announce the uh, winner of the Minorities in Economics Award, which is an award that's basically being given for a paper on a topic related to uh, minorities that's been submitted to uh, the conference. And uh, the Minorities Committee, which is uh, uh, presided by Massimo Morelli, who could not be here, so uh, he asked me to basically read out uh, 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 this award. Um, he says it's been difficult to evaluate. There was very good uh, papers. They had a long list. They brought it down to a short list of uh, seven. Then they had difficulties picking one. They had to pick one, so which they did. Uh, but they also decided to pick uh, uh, two runners-up. Let me just uh, quickly announce first the, the runners-up. It's a paper by Elon Rubinstein on price and prejudice, and a second paper by uh, Zara Murad, Emel uh, Osturk, Yi Sheng, and Sigrid Sutens on ethnic salience and discrimination. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming. <laughs> And the paper that wins the award uh, is a, a paper by Ethan Kaplan, York Spenkuj, and uh, Cody Tuttle. It's on school desegregation and political preferences, long-run evidence from Kentucky. Let me read uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the citation. They provide a well-identified study of important effects of segregation and hence of desegregation policies. Exploiting a randomized uh, uh, busing policy in Kentucky, they find long-run effects of exposure to a large share of black fellow uh, students in high school on ideolog ideological preferences, and it confirms Alport's contact hypothesis. In particular, whites randomly uh, are more exposed to black fellow students, and they're more likely to turn Democrat and less likely to donate money to conservative causes when uh, adults. The impact on racial attitudes can also be derived. Uh, they have chosen this paper because of the uh, salience in policy debates also in Europe on the consequences of segregation, uh, segregation uh, of ethnic groups uh, in cities. Please join me in uh, congratulating Ethan Kaplan, who's here. Let me now introduce the Marshall Lecture. It's one of the uh, plenary lectures. I'm personally extremely pleased to introduce uh, Xavier Gabay, which, uh, uh, who was chosen by the, the program committee to deliver this uh, uh, lecture. Like, you know, he doesn't need an introduction, but let me just do it anyway. Um, I think you know, Xavier is, is, apart from being a very nice uh, person, very great to talk about uh, uh, anything, including economics, um, is also an impressive academic. I think of him as being someone who has basically started three fields apart from all the other stuff that he's written on. And these three fields are, I would say, basically the role of the distribution of population across cities, which is one of his very early uh, papers that basically started the whole literature uh, on it. A second piece on sorting in the market for CEOs and that this is really a new novel explanation for understanding why uh, inequality and compensation for CEOs has gone up uh, uh, so much. That paper by itself started a whole new literature. There was a lot of work on CEO compensation, but that just that new insight uh, made a huge difference. And third on something more recent on the granular uh, origins of uh, uh, aggregate fluctuations. I remember Boyd and Jovanovic always saying, you know, there's nothing we can say at the firm level when there's fluctuations at the firm level that this is ever going to mean anything in terms of business cycles. And, and, and Xavier comes up and says, well, not so sure because we have to look at what fat tail distributions do. And if you have a Walmart that has a positive or negative productivity shock, that has huge implications for uh, providers uh, and, and therefore can have ag aggregate implications. That by itself has led to you know, a, a huge literature uh, thinking not just about the size distribution, but about input-output networks that uh, uh, link firms. So, you know, 
uh, I think we all wish to write one paper that starts a literature. Well, Xavier has written three at least, and then he has a bunch of papers on behavioral finance, on, on many other issues. I said it, I always enjoy talking to him. He was here for a talk maybe about eight or ten years ago, and we were discussing some paper. At some point, we were going to do a back of the envelope calculation. <laughs> I was standing up to my computer to type you know, the numbers in to calculate what the back of the envelope number was. He said, don't do it. I want to do it out of my head. I have to keep trained. So, you know, at the same time, if you have any kind of uh, arithmetic that you want to pass by, Xavier is going to be very happy to do it. So, um, it's a great pleasure, and I'm looking forward uh, uh, to his talk. He's going to be talking about uh, the economic networks, new models, facts, and identification methods. Join me in uh, welcoming Xavier. <laughs> Okay, great. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, Jan, for this uh, uh, very, very kind uh, introduction. Um, so I, I will talk about, uh, I, I would like to leave you guys with two thoughts, okay? Uh, and they will look disconnected, but actually intimately uh, connected. So one is about the origins of financial fluctuations. So I propose a way to, uh, for you to think differently about the origin of financial fluctuations. Uh, initially, you're going to be in complete disbelief. You say, ah, it can't be true. Uh, and I hope near the end I'll, I'll convince you it's actually true. Uh, and and uh, related, uh, that was to measure the, that thought, uh, a, a new and quite general method to find instruments and estimate causal parameters in economics. So mostly I've been like macro, macro finance, maybe trade a little bit, but it applies to uh, other things. So it's based on three papers actually. Uh, for the first part, we, uh, with uh, Ralph Coygen, all, all, all three, um, was a fantastic uh, empirical asset price at Chicago, uh, in search of the origins of financial fluctuations, the inelastic markets hypothesis, I explain what this is, and then um, it leads to some empirical work and we develop a methodology called granular instrumental variables that's of, I think, general, uh, general interest, okay? So number two uses number one as, as uh, methodology and there's an extension with Gabriel Chodor Reich to uh, general economic uh, networks. Uh, okay, so uh, original financial fluctuation. So we don't have a full answer, but we have something which uh, we think it may, may be an important part of the answer. So um, why is financial market so volatile? So a typical uh, feature in modern either rational models, macro finance models, or behavioral uh, macro finance models, is that markets are very macro elastic. It means that um, if, for instance, sovereign wealth fund buys 10% you know, of the US stock market, the stock market will almost not move at all. And how is that possible? Well, remember, uh, the value of a stock is the present value of future dividends. This forms both the, uh, both the stock market, some fraction of the stock market, the, the dividends have not changed. So the present value remains the same, except maybe the discount factor ch changes, but normally it should not really change because everybody shares the risk. So in, in, in theory, everybody would like to sell this fund a little bit of their shares and, and, and the prices will move essentially uh, not at all. Uh, and that has a practical, that view, which we'll say is wrong, has practical implications. Flow in financial markets don't matter. So central bank interventions in foreign exchange should not matter, or in other markets like bond and uh, stock should not matter. Difference in beliefs should not matter for prices and expected return. It all should be priced all very, very rationally. Or maybe we have beliefs, but, but flows per se should not, uh, should not matter. So we propose, we say this is very wrong, and, and we propose an alternative view uh, that markets are very macro inelastic. It means that if, say, Jan wants to buy some uh, shares, Instead of all of us selling a little bit of our shares to Jan, uh, most of us will do nothing at all, okay? And a few people will maybe be will, will willing to sell some shares to provide some elasticity of supply to the, to the market, but uh, it will be very small, actually. As a result, flows by Jan and all his uh, cousins will have a, a large impact on prices and also future returns. Uh, in a Kyle model, it will be just prices, but future returns remain the same. Here, prices are too high. Prices will become higher if Jan buys a lot, and, and, and in, in the long run, returns will be lower as, as uh, dividend price ratios are lower. And so we refer this to, to this as the inelastic markets hypothesis. Okay, 
And, um, and so we developed a whole new model, and I won't show you the, the big macro part, but I will show you some, uh, some, some part of the model that digestible in, in half an hour, I think. Um, and um, we talk about why markets um, macro inelastic, basically because most people are inattentive. And how do you measure flows in the stock market? What's the flow anyway? Because for every buy, there's a sell, so what's the flow? So we'll clarify all that. And then we want to measure the effect, okay? And that's, where, that's why we developed these granular instrumental variables for, and I'll, I'll explain very clear, hopefully clearly what it is. Let me show you the, the, the headline on some simple numbers to, uh, that can be remembered. So it will be, suppose that Jan buys one euro, I'll say, worth of the aggregate European stock markets, okay? Then this will increase the, first in the rational model, that should increase the valuation of the aggregate market by zero. Okay, because it's still the present value of the same dividends. But in inelastic markets, as we calibrate it, um, if Yan buys one dollar worth of the aggregate stock market, the aggregate stock market valuation goes up by five dollars. Okay, and it's symmetric between buy and sell. So if Yan was to sell one hundred dollars euros worth of European stock market, the aggregate euro stock market would fall by five hundred uh, euros. Okay. So you get this big multiplier of one to five, and we understand very clearly why, where it comes from, by the way. Another way to say the same thing is to, if you buy 1% or epsilon percent, 1% of a market, it makes the market go up by 5%. Again, it's symmetric between buy and sell. I say five really when we estimate and calibrate, maybe it's between three and eight, some, something, something like that, okay? And, uh, um, and so we have a framework to think about uh, all, uh, all of this. So let's see, why, is, why would have you, and I'll talk about the policy implications uh, later. So, uh, you know, why, why would it be the case? So I, I'm going to show you a few pictures. None of them are like dispositive, but they're suggestive of the uh, you know, kind of model you want to write and really the kind of intuition, intuition of the world you want to have. So, okay, so many funds are very, very uh, constrained. So 100%, uh, uh, okay. So suppose you have a 100% equity fund. Um, so that's a fund that's always 100% in equities. It cannot provide any elasticity. And I should differentiate here between micro and macro elasticity. So this paper is all about the macro elasticity. Jan buys uh, you know, 100 euros worth of stocks, selling 100 euros worth of bonds. That's as opposed to buying you know, one stock and selling the other stock, that would be the micro elasticities that have been studied a lot. Okay? Um, and so, but now, uh, if you have a fund that ha that's always by, by mandate 100% in equities, it cannot provide any elasticity to, the, to Jan and, and, and his uh, cousins uh, because he cannot accept any bond. Okay? So, um, so let's look at how, um, how let's look at mutual funds. This is in the US since uh, 1993. So, this is here in green, the uh, properly weighted. Average allocation of um, funds in equities, the rest being in, in uh, bonds, okay? And so basically you say it's around 85%, which would be useful for the calibration, okay? And it's very stable, okay? There's been big generations of the price dividend ratios and the like. Still very stable allocation at 85%, okay? So it's consistent with some sort of mandate, and, and that's what we're going to use that for, uh, uh, for the modeling. Uh, if you look at pension funds, it's also very stable at around uh, 70%. Okay? And uh, exchange traded funds is basically 100%. Okay? So think uh, all those funds, uh, for whatever reason, we can speak, we'll talk about why, uh, they want to be in that, with that kind of fixed allocation, even though the markets may be out of whack in some sense, or price uh, earnings ratios are out of uh, you know, balance, so to speak. Um, Okay, now you might say, what about other entities, maybe like hedge funds, who are very agile, etc. So the main thing is, uh, hedge funds are just very small, okay? They, they own only maybe 5% of the market, and that's just the long uh, part of the market, okay? And on top of that, uh, so it's just too small to really matter, and uh, in the big, long run aggregate, they might matter for a you know, little blip uh, you know, at the end of the day or something, but not for the aggregate at macro scales. Uh, like a three months, a year, and, um, and also on top of that, in, they reduce their allocation in bad times, okay? Because their investors pull out, they say, you lost money, I want to get out. So they don't provide much elasticity at all uh, to the market, okay? 
And uh, so there's this literature on the microelasticity, looking at the elasticity, what happens if you buy Apple and sell Google, one dollar of each, what happens to them? So a typical methodology, you have, um, it's the uh, what happens to the to a stock if it's uh, included in index. And then p papers find consistently that it's very inelastic at the micro level. And what we're saying here, it's also very macro inelastic at the macro level. And, and that's much more uh, important, arguably, because the aggregate valuation of equities will be, uh, will be uh, wrong. OK. Um, by the way, it contradicts common beliefs in finance. You know how sometimes you write a paper and you're kind of excited, and then people tell you, uh, well, I kind of knew it. So we know we would get that, and we decided to preempt that. So we, we, we did a, a, a poll of economists. So this was the poll. If a fund buys $1 billion worth of equities, permanently it sells bonds to finance that position, slowly over a quarter, how much does the aggregate market value of equities change? So in the simplest efficient market answer, the answer is changes by $0, because you know, arbitrageurs pin the prices to fundamentals, present value of dividends. But in inelastic markets, it would be which would change the aggregate value of, of uh, the market by five billion. Okay? So we asked a number of, uh, you know, a number of surveys, it was my first and almost only foray on Twitter to solicit answers uh, uh, there. And so the median answer was zero. So people have learned their undergraduate textbook. Uh, indeed, uh, you know, pr prices are independent of flows, very good. Uh, should be. Uh, but in fact, and the median answer conditionally on being strictly positive was zero, zero, 001. So, whereas we think the truth is like five. So, if we're correct, you know, we're off the uh, conventional wisdom by a factor of 500. Okay? Uh, so, let's see if we're correct. So, first, uh, and here, here's some, um, some, uh, some paper. So, it's part of doing quantitative uh, behavioral finance based on you know, uh, major, uh, major forces as we see them. Okay, so here's a two-payer model to clarify the economics. Okay, uh, so even if you don't know any finance, I think it's a useful model to, to see and it's totally easy to follow. Uh, so we, um, we have a big macro model in section five where it ties the loose end, but let's say for now, there's an exogenous interest rate, say zero percent and average risk premium. So there are two assets, there's the aggregate stock, with an exogenous supply QS, like supply of shares, with an endogenous price P, and a bond in a big bond in aggregate supply BS, like supply of bonds. And there are two funds. There's a pure bond fund that just holds the bonds, and a, a bonds, and a balanced funds that has the following mandate. And the mandate is the following. The quantity, this is the demand by the fund, this is the wealth of the fund, assets and management, and this is the endogenous price of, of shares. So this is the average, the, the average allocation of a fund in equities should be theta. That's the mandate. And that would, if kappa was zero, that would just be theta. And we calibrate the theta to be 85%, like we've seen for mutual funds. Okay? And then if uh, the risk premium, if kappa is strictly positive, then uh, you get this extra um, part of the mandate. So if the risk premium is higher than some benchmark, then you buy more equities. If equities are a bigger deal, you buy more equities. In some sense, the traditional rational model would be kappa almost infinity. We calibrate it to be very close to zero, actually. Okay? Um, uh, good. So if consumers were rational, the fund's mandate wouldn't matter at all, because whatever the fund does, uh, consumers could undo, but our consumers will not be uh, fully rational. Uh, okay, so uh, here's the main uh, thought experiment in the, that starts, in some sense, the paper. So suppose that time, there are two periods, zero and one. Time zero minus epsilon, everything was balanced, uh, the rates premium was where it should be. And at time t equals zero, so Jan wakes up for no particular reason, decides to allocate delta f, I'll, I'll go back to dollars, dollars into the balance fund. Okay, he goes to the balance fund, so he got maybe delta F dollars from uh, Pompeo Fabra. Uh, del those delta F dollars, he says, okay, invest them to the, goes to the balance fund, invest them according to your mandate. So that's a F, little f in flow, which is the amount of dollars divided by the wealth of the fund. And so we work out the equilibrium when the fund needs to keep that mandate. So here's the answer. The equity prices go up by a percentage amount, which is the percentage flow in the market, so maybe it was 1% in flow, divided by zeta, where zeta is the central object in this uh, inelastic market's view, which is the 
the elasticity of demand for equities, the macro elasticity, by the way, is the Marshallian, not the Hicksian demand, uh, in case you were wondering, given the context of this lecture. Anyway, so income effects matter. So, uh, okay, so uh, what's zeta? It's one minus theta, where theta is the equity share. Kappa was your sensitivity of the risk premium to uh, equities, to, to the sort of sensitive demand to, uh, to the uh, risk premium, and delta is the dividend price ratio. So calibration. So we'll say theta is around 0 0.85, I'm not 85% on equities. Uh, kappa is very close to zero. There are some thought experiments and, and, and empirical work, but basically we we'll say, let's say one. Uh, and delta, the dividend price ratio is about 4%. So in total, that's about, that's about 0 0.2, okay? So, uh, so zeta is 0 0.2, so one over zeta is five. So it means that if you uh, invest one extra dollar in the stock market, it makes the stock market go up by five dollars. So that's the origin of this five, which is the inverse of the 0 0.2, the elasticity of uh, demand for uh, stocks. So let, let, let's do a undergraduate, let's see uh, an undergraduate example to see where everything uh, goes. So suppose you have a balance fund at, the mandate is to have 80% in shares and no sensitivity otherwise to risk premium, so zeta should be 0 0.2. And in the whole world, there are uh, 80 shares and B units of a bond. And the initial price of the stocks were $1 a share. And so where, where's the bond in, the, in, in this whole economy? Uh, the balance fund owns all the stocks, all the 80 shares at $1 a share, so $80 worth of stocks. And the mandate here is that it should have a 4 to 1 ratio of stocks to bonds in value. So it should hold $20 worth of bonds, so $100 in total in the balance fund. And all, where, where are they? all the other bonds, they in the bond fund, B minus $20 in the bond fund, B being the total number of bonds. So now, uh, let's say Jan wakes up and decides to reallocate $1 for the bond fund, takes the bond for bond fund, and uh, brings it to a balance fund. So what happens in equilibrium? So the bond fund holds B minus $21. Those $21, they must be in the balance fund. Now remember, the balance fund needs to have a 4 to 1 ratio of uh, stocks to bonds. So it should own $84 worth of stocks. But at the same time, there are only still 80 shares. Okay, so the price of each share, the price, total price of shares, uh, total price of each share must be $84, the total value of shares, divided by 80, so 1.05. So the price increased by 5%, went from 1 to 1.05. So there was a 1% inflow, and the price went up by 5%. Okay, there's a little proof, and it can be much more uh, generally uh, done. Okay. Uh, you can now, once you have this fourth experiment, so that's the core of basically the uh, inelasticity of markets. I think the same holds, by the way, for foreign exchange and long-term bonds and all that, but here I'll just do stocks versus uh, bonds. Um, so suppose you have, uh, uh, just preparing the empirical work, suppose you have N funds, what happens? If you have N funds and, and you linearize the demand of fund I, and let's call QI the change is the log demand and little p the change is the log price, of shares. Um, this will be the elasticity of demand, and they have a mandate with theta i and kappa i. So theta i in, in equities and kappa i sensitivity to risk premium. So the demand, if I linearize, the demand of fund i will have this shape. Then I can say, what's the aggregate demand? I do the size, I just calculate the size weighted sum of all the demands, and I find that. Okay? So it means, in particular, the aggregate elasticity will be the size weighted sum of the elasticities, which makes sense. More interestingly, so everything works with this representative fund. So you can use the representative fund um, idealization. But now everything works. Now there's also this aggregate flow here. So let's look at it. So what's an aggregate flow anyway? And what's the problem? Because somebody might say, somebody always says in a seminar, well, for every buyer, there's a seller, which is true. Uh, so the sum of the flow should be zero across all the funds in and out of the flows, and the sum of the changes of shares held should be also zero. So how can you even define an aggregate flow? Uh, recall, we, this is how we aggregated. So a proper definition of the aggregate flow is the following. If there's a delta i, delta f i dollar inflow out of, uh, sorry, dollar inflow in fund i, could be positive or negative, times theta, now you multiply by theta i, which is the 
basically the marginal propensity of investing in, in uh, equities by fund I, so a pure bond fund at zero, for a big fund here that was uh, 80%, and you divide by the previous value of uh, uh, equity market, that is the aggregate flow that the theory actually, in most accounting, wants to have. Okay? So what's a great, what, uh, an aggregate inflow uh, is a well-defined object, it's not the sum of a delta, a delta F5, which should be zero, is some of the flows into funds times their uh, marginal, here's really uh, average, because it's the same, propensity to invest into equities. And with that, you have a well-defined notion of flows in and out of a stock market. Okay? And you can measure that, which is something we, uh, we do. Okay, uh, so this was a two-period model. So what happens in, uh, in uh, uh, preparing also the empirical work, and, and, and even just for conceptual clarity, what if there's an infinite horizon? Um, it's very much the same. So let's say at every period you say there's a mandate, uh, an aggregate mandate with the same theta and kappa. Um, and uh, let me take some simplified notations. The paper is very rigorous, but that it's a little tedious. So le let's say there's, imagine some P bar, D bar. It's uh, the value that should happen if you had constant price dividend ratio, some sort of you know, rational equilibrium. And little PT is the deviation from that kind of rational or at least a constant discount rate uh, benchmark, okay? And let's say little ft is the cumulative flow since a period where there was uh, zero flow, okay? There's zero. Uh, okay, so if you say now this is the mandate at each period, at each period there are also flows and also some could be predictable, some non-predictable, that's fine. What is the equilibrium? So we work it out. And the equilibrium is the following. So the price deviations a little pity from the rational benchmark in log, will be, you know, in the two-payer model, it was the flow divided by zeta. But here, in the infinite horizon period, it's the, cumulative, it's the present value, discounted with, at this rate, rho, present value of future, of future cumulative flows divided by zeta, with also what happens to uh, expected dividends. Okay? And you discount at the rate rho, that's here, that's more myopic than the dividend price ratios. So uh, inelastic markets are always a bit more myop or somewhat more myopic than uh, a rational markets. Okay? So future flows, future dividends do affect the price today, but less intensely than they would in, a, in a, the future is more discounted than they would in a purely traditional rational market. So let's do two experiments with that. Suppose you have a permanent inflow. So Jan, uh, invested in, in this extra dollar in the, in the market, and it's basically permanent. Uh, then there's a permanent increase in the price. Okay, the price went on permanently. Uh, the flow divided by zeta, so times five. But also there's a permanent fall in the risk premium. So basically, stock market prices are very uh, high, and as a result, future returns are going to be lower because dividend price ratios are going to be low. Okay, and. Uh, uh, as a little cali it's useful to do a little calibration. So suppose there was a, a 2% inflow last year, and that one of the zeta is 5, so there's a 5% increase in the price. So there's a 10% increase in the price. 2% inflow, uh, 5 multiplier. 10% increase the price. And let's say the dividend price ratio is 4%. So it means here there's, the equity premium is lower, but by 40 basis points, 0.4% per year. Okay? So it's not a tremendous tremendously tempting trade if you want to think about the, you know, the market equilibrium. Prices are too high, risk premiums are going to be lower, but it's not a particularly you know, attractive trade in any, in, in any way. That's part of why uh, people don't you know, react very much to, to that. If a flow uh, mean reverted, so Jan might you know, uh, take his dollar back uh, stochastically or some fraction every year, uh, then the price impact is a little is lower uh, measured by in this, uh, in this manner, and we use that for the empirical work. Okay, so, um, so this is like the um, you know, core, core um, micro of the inelastic market hypothesis. The paper will also do a whole macro model, you know, clearing all the markets, clearing consumption, all that. Uh, let me tell you a little bit. One of the things we do, and I won't have the time to, we want to replace the Euler equation for risky assets. So 
one of the uh, uh, dram uh, big shames of uh, macro is this uh, centrality of the Euler equation. Okay, so bravo, Lucas, wherever you are. But still, for almost everything, but not for the Euler equation. For it's a it's a terrible equation. Okay, it never works. I, every time you try to estimate, it never works. Okay, but you need to replace it by something. Okay, and uh, anyway, so here. Uh, part of what we do is we replace the uh, Euler equation for stocks, which says, oh, the pr price of stocks depend on their covariance with ma marginal cons utility of consumption, which nobody has reasoned, I think, in the real world this way, uh, via uh, flows. So you have stochastic flows and inelastic markets, and, and prices are just, and then ex post, you have, um, anyway, you have a equilibrium price of stocks, but it's not a useful way to, f it has no special bearing with marginal utility of consumption. Anyway, there's empirical guidance on how to, uh, for the holding of our assets, and uh, we have a framework to connect prices, fundamentals, and portfolio flows, and also macro um, outcomes to understand expected returns across markets and asset classes. And if you want more broadly, it's part of behavioral macro, it will be uh, and one central theme in behavioral macro that's proven useful is sort of inattention, or it's very hard to foresee the future, you know, and sort of see what happens with central, uh, central uh, forward guidance, etc., etc. Um, and there's been a number of papers, and I've, I've, I've been in, the, I am intensely in that area, I love it. Uh, and here it's, uh, those papers is more like pure macro, but here how to change the macro finance. Uh, it's not just not thinking about too much about the future, but also not thinking too much about uh, not monitoring the stock market all the time. That creates the inelasticity. Anyway, this is all uh, good. So we developed this theory. I'm not showing you, but I'm just saying it exists in the paper. But now is how, you might say, Xavier, how do you, you talk to us about this one to five uh, multiplier. Uh, how do you measure that in practice? And so we banged our head uh, against the wall for a year and a half before stumbling upon this uh, idea of the um, uh, granular instrumental variables, okay? And, and we developed that in a standalone paper, okay? So the, the causal, and, and so we'll use that to do, to measure uh, stock, uh, the, the price impacts of uh, uh, flows in the stock market. So uh, many of you, many of us here are macroeconomists, not, not all of us. Uh, there's a big need for instruments in economics in general, but it's particularly true in uh, particularly true in uh, macro, okay? And, uh, and so we, we think those granular instrumental variables could be a very useful way to have a, a fairly general source of uh, instruments. So uh, Jan w w was uh, uh, kindly talked about this uh, granular hypothesis, but been, you know, uh, been obsessed with. So uh, let me just say a few things about that, and then I, I go to the, uh, how to use that to do uh, instrumentation. So, what does it mean, uh, granular? So it's, the idea is that uh, you want to have a physical view of the economy. It just take shocks to the large firms or the large countries or large industries to have a non-trivial impact on economic output. And if you want, there are incompressible, incompressible grains of economic volatility, uh, firm level, say, volatility, and maybe that's due to, you know, the CEO suddenly becomes very bullish about electricity or uh, bearish, uh, and, and those are bets. And so those are TFP shocks that uh, affect everything else where it could be investment demand shocks and, and the like, okay? A few, b before showing, I, 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 I'll talk about a few empirical results, but it's useful to have just a simp some simple descriptive statistics to see a, a reality. Uh, so in Japan, for instance, the top 10 firms, they account for 35% of the exports. So, you know, it could be interesting to look at one firm, two firms, uh, see what they do, look at the impact, just to understand the dynamics of, uh, of, of, of exports. In Korea, it's even more concentrated. The top two firms, Samsung and Hyundai, uh, account for 35% of the exports. And actually, their sales are 22% of Korean GDP. Two firms, 22% of Korean uh, GDP. So again, understanding what happens there is just interesting. And also, idiosyncratic shocks to the CEO of those firms, if, if you want, will have repelled important imp impacts on the economy, and that's where w w the instrumentation is going to uh, come. In the US, the top 25 firms account for more than 50% of earnings and dividends. So if you want, you know, idiosyncratic shocks to Apple's dividend policy poof affects the amount of cash people have in their pockets and, and you can look that, use, use that as an instrument, potentially. We'll be much more systematic about that. So in that um, 2011 paper, um, you know, some um, 
uh, initial attempt at quantification and, and uh, maybe uh, inducing shocks to large firms, except maybe one third of aggregate fluctuations. Uh, in France, with this uh, economic car paper, it's about 40% for shocks to large firms, uh, explaining 40% of fluctuations. This is not just, a, I love this recent paper, so by Förster, et al., and Watson. Um, it's not just for you know, short-term business cycle stuff. It turns out that um, if you look at TFP, so what, the, what are the origins of long-term growth? So I think it's, I mean, it's a very fascinating uh, topic. It's a little stuck. I mean, I know there are lots of papers with patents and all that, but I, I think this paper and this view uh, by, by uh, first at all will, uh, will be helpful. So basically, we look at 60 disaggregated sectors, and we say what happens to the growth. In fact, that almost all the growth is granular, actually, in the sense that you have over 16 sectors, they have idiosyncratic TFP shocks over the past uh, four, 50 years or so, and the principal component of them is actually very small. And so the healthcare sector has its own vagary of shocks, the construction sector has its own vagary of other shocks, etc., etc. And there is a bit of a principal component, it's not very, very large actually. Uh, so potentially using those kind of granular shocks could be useful to understand growth. Uh, another very, very nice paper, Amity Weinstein, they look at idiocratic shocks to uh, Japanese banks. So they lost some money in a US bet, so they want to shrink their lending in Japan, and they look at the impact on uh, uh, aggregate lending rate in Japan, and they get maybe 30% or 40% of uh, fluctuations explained by those idiosyncratic uh, shocks, okay? So that's what we're going to use for the granular IV. Uh, again, granular view, shocks to those large firms, they affect uh, GDP. Now, there are some more, maybe a bit esoteric, I think, you know, why is that the case? Naively, you might say, look, if you have a country of size N with a very large, you know, millions of firms, volatility of GDP should decay like one of a squat of N, uh, is in the central limit theorem, about to be very, very small. But actually, firm sizes, they do follow a very fat tail distribution, uh, actually the maximally fat tail distribution, the zips law, and then the volatility decays in one of a log N. So, and why is that? Just intuitively, because uh, when you have this uh, kind of zips law, the, few, the top large firms have a very non-trivial uh, share of the aggregate activity, basically a few very large firms, and, and so necessarily the idiosyncratic fluctuations affect the aggregate. And why do you, would you get anyway the zip flow? That's like my first paper ever. Uh, in part, is, well, almost always, is because the random growth of firms, and you do have random growth of firms, leads to Pareto distribution under weak conditions to actually zip distribution. So that's where in almost all countries in the world and all markets in the world, you get this fat tail distribution, a few large firms uh, affecting, affecting the, uh, the aggregate. So anyway, what we're doing in the GIV, granular IV, is using that kind of physical view to then do identification. Here's the, uh, so first intuitively, we need to uh, try to get what's idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic shock by you know, Apple, Nokia, Walmart, et cetera, et cetera, and look at the impact on the rest of the economy. That's how we're going to uh, analyze things. Now, a big problem is you need to purge the data from the aggregate shocks, because Apple has both idiosyncratic shocks and aggregate shocks. So a uh, big part of the thinking is how to do that, okay? And we have econometric theorems and all that. Uh, and, and also, in some sense, every single firm level shock is a valid instrument. So how to, so you have lots of other identifying restrictions, but how do you optimally aggregate those idiosyncratic shocks? So that's part of uh, the thinking. So some of the, uh, so I'll show you very precisely how we do that, but uh, b before going into like the, the, the math and the, the details, uh, you can, here's some things you can study with a granular IV, uh, GIV approach. So the firm expands, okay? So say, uh, you know, Marriott wants to produ uh, decides to cr create more hotels in Barcelona. Do the other uh, firms, uh, hotel chains, react uh, positively, they compete and they upgrade themselves, or negatively, um, and, and they, they kind of give up in a, in a sense? Uh, you could measure that with idiosyncratic shocks by the large, uh, investment shocks by the large hotels, and you see how uh, all the other uh, actors in the hotel sector react. Uh, sovereign financial uh, sector doom loops. So if an Italian bank, if an uh, Italian bank dies poorly, is going to affect the uh, rating of Italy, and if the rating of Italy dies poorly, it's going to affect the bank, and you can study those doom loops uh, very precisely. 
uh, and actually with causal identification via the GIV, using idiosyncratic shocks to those large banks to see how the whole system reacts. Uh, you can look at growth spillovers. So suppose, uh, you know, China does well, what happens to the rest of the world? Suppose, uh, you know, this automobile firm does well, Tesla does well, uh, uh, what happens to the rest of the world? Um, and there are positive, negatives that could also be useful for, for growth, okay? Um, traditional identification requires an enormous amount of factual knowledge and like in in inventivity and maybe a lot, okay? So uh, you need to have, oh, there was a tax reform because this senator in this committee died or, uh, or something like that. Or there's a China shock. Those are one-off events or China shock of auto at all. Um, you know, China enters the WTO, you have a shock, maybe it lasts for a few years, but then it's gone, okay? So you're, 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 you're no more instruments, okay? Whereas if you think of the GIV way, you could say, look, you have uh, ex export productivity shocks by countries every quarter for all the countries. And so, and all of them is a valid instrument. Maybe there are some are weak, but if you aggregate, they, they become strong but because economies are granular. Idiosyncratic shocks uh, of large firms uh, affect the aggregate. And as a result, you have 100 China shocks that you can use uh, all the time to do, uh, to do uh, analysis. Uh, what's the link with Bartic, Bartic instruments? So it's very different, okay? But I think th this is the success story of the past uh, 15 years in macro, macro labor, if you want. Um, and and uh, so GIVs are orthogonal in some sense. So they allow you to, Bartic instruments, they allow you to estimate cross-sectional relationship. You affect more this state than that state than what happens to the difference between the outcomes. But it cannot allow you to talk about the aggregate as a missing intercept problem. This literature was GIVs actually do allow you to think about the aggregate or designed to think about the aggregate. Okay, so let me show you how it actually works with, with theorems, not just uh, words, okay? Um, so this looks very boring, this is very, very important, so please pay attention to this slide. Uh, there will be N uh, countries in my little example. I have an example of uh, oil, world oil market, uh, and it could be N firms. The relative sizes are SI for firm I, or country I, and the sum is, sum is one. And for a variable XI, we'll define uh, different size weighted averages. XE will be the equal weighted average, and XS will be the size weighted average. Okay? So if you want to do economics, what matters always is the size weighted average. If you want to do statistics to get precision, in what you want to take the equal weighted average. And often the granular instrument will be the difference between the two. But I, I'll explain why and when. Okay. So, okay, so let's, see, let's imagine a simple model of the, oil, uh, of the oil market. So country I, it's IID, the world is IID. Country I has a demand for oil, the number of barrels of oil. Some constant Y bar, it doesn't matter. SI is the average size of uh, country I in terms of share of uh, absorption of oil in uh, each year. But in your T, is that times one plus yit, yit has been zero, and we'll model yit this way. So yit, the, the percentage change in the demand of, um, uh, for oil by country I, will be, depend on the price of oil, pt, with this elasticity phi d. So we want to, we'd like to measure that elasticity of demand phi d. And also on idiosyncratic shock uit that will be absolutely uh, central, okay? And also, there could be some aggregate shocks. Uh, there's a vector of aggregate shocks, eta t, and a vector of uh, loadings, uh, lambda i. So there's a vector loadings by uh, country i on those uh, aggregate shocks. And so what's the aggregate demand in the world? It's the sum of the demands. So it's uh, y bar times 1 plus y s, where, where y s is the size weighted sum of the uh, y i's. So this is the demand side. What's the supply side? So here we just model it as it's y bar times one plus pt minus, so pt is some demand uh, price of oil, the difference compared to the mean, minus some supply shock and divided by alpha, where alpha will be the inverse supply elasticity of oil, but also we would like to estimate. So in equilibrium supply equals demand, how is that possible? The price has just to make that happen. And uh, as a result, uh, you get the price will be alpha times the aggregate supply of oil plus epsilon t. Okay, so we want to estimate 
alpha v uh, demand elasticity of supply for oil, or in inverse elasticity of supply for oil, and also phi d elasticity of demand. Okay? So it would be maybe tempted at least for five seconds to do OLS, regressing um, the price, uh, price change this year and the quantity change this year, but it's uh, invalid because this thing and that, those two things are, are correlated. Okay, so it's, uh, you can do it, but it's, uh, it will be a biased estimate. Okay, so we need an instrument. So um, the instrument will be the idiosyncratic, all these vector of idiosyncratic shocks, demand shocks. And so the key assumption is that these idiosyncratic shocks are truly idiosyncratic and they're uncorrelated with the vector of aggregate shocks here and epsilon t. Okay? And you can have tests for those things, by the way. Okay? Uh, so that would be the, uh, the key, uh, key assumption. If you want, you, you can expand your factor model to have more and more factors, but at, the, at some point, you, you have all, uh, they don't matter anymore, and you have still some nice, big idiosyncratic shocks. Okay, so let's, uh, let me keep the math uh, as simple as possible, just for communication, to see how, it, uh, to see how uh, everything uh, can work. So the con consumption, uh, log consumption in country I will be yit, this is the equation I had, and so here I just take a very simple factor model where all the countries load with a factor eta t on the common shock. This is not lambda i eta t, just eta t, okay? And later we can, we can generalize, That's, uh, that will be easy. So let me form those two averages, size-weighted average of the demand changes, and this is the absorption rate changes, the things are observed in, in, with data, and the equal weighted average. So the size weighted average will have price times the elasticity plus the common shock plus the size weighted sum of the idiosyncratic shocks. And the equal weighted average uh, will have the same price elasticity, the same common shock, and the equal weighted average of the idiosyncratic shocks. So the first uh, appearance of a granular instrumental variable is to, do, to take this size weighted minus equal weighted average of uh, the, the demand growth in your T. Okay, or absorption growth in, in your T. So when you do that, the price and its elasticity cancel out. That's very, very important. And also the um, common factor cancels out. So all that remains is US minus UE. Uh, this is the size weighted sum of idiosyncratic shock. And this is a very small term actually in practice, but it's there, uh, the, the equal weighted sum of idiosyncratic shocks. Okay, so what, what happened here? We extracted this uh, granular uh, IV from data, you know, in our like, Excel spreadsheet, we have a growth rate of consumption of oil every, every year. Uh, we form those averages, so it's from data. But inside the logic of a model, it's only made of idiosyncratic shocks. And remember, we assumed that they were orthogonal to the aggregate shocks, in, 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 par in particular the epsilon t. So let's look at the implications of that. So here, um, just recap, this is the aggregate supply of oil. This is the price is this. Uh, from the market clearing, the price is the aggregate, sorry, it's the aggregate demand for oil, aggregate demand times this uh, inverse elasticity uh, alpha, and we have ZT uh, made uh, size minus equal weighted. Okay, um, so for an instrument to be valid, we need two things, exogenity and relevance. The key thing here is, is exogenous. Because ZT is made of, made of idiosyncratic demand shocks, it is uh, orthogonal to this aggregate supply shock, so exogenity, and also generically is going to be relevant. I'll, I'll, I'll say more uh, soon. Um, so, given we have this supply equation here, uh, add the correct alpha, p minus alpha times the quantity change is orthogonal to zt. So, after a bit of reshuffling, alpha will be that. So, in practice, we have identified this way the price elasticity from the GIV. Empirically, we're going to take covariance of the GIV with prices, devalue covariance of GIV with quantity changes, and that's going to identify this elasticity of uh, supply. Okay? Um, the first time I presented that at uh, an economic uh, seminar, people were furiously, uh, I said, two, two eminent uh, senior econometricians were furiously saying, first, it cannot be true because we have theorems saying, you know, in a very basic textbook, uh, if you have a uh, to, to identify the slope of supply and demand, you need two instruments. And here, with one instrument, we can identify the, the slope of both supply and demand. Okay? 
uh, sorry, it cannot be true. It is true is because we have disaggregated uh, demand, or if we had disaggregated supply, that would be the case. As soon as one of the two sides is disaggregated, then you can identify both sides of supply and demand. Okay. Uh, okay, when is it, uh, what's the variance of the estimator? When is it a good estimator or not? So here's the variance of the estimator. You want a low variance for to have a good estimator. And the variance of the estimator is low when you have a higher FINDAL, so basically a very disaggregated economy, a few big countries if you want, and a high, uh, high value of idiosyncratic shocks compared to the aggregate shocks. Okay, so that sounds granular if you want. Uh, economies and in many many markets we do find uh, again uh, that this is the case in most all markets okay so in, in the in, in the actual paper then we extend that uh, basic thought experiment in a, in a big way um, and I won't go over everything at all don't worry uh, what if you have time varying sizes very easy you replace SI by you know maybe previous period size what if the shocks are heteroscedastic with almost the same except for some small things uh, do we reach maximal precision? Yes, what I showed you uh, gives you the maximal precision, actually. What if there's a research factor structure? I'll talk about that uh, and, and, and lots of other things. So let me talk about a few, a few such things. Uh, first, the above is the optimal GIV. So why is that useful? Because each, each country shock is potentially an instrument. We actually want to do the, the shock in the domain of this country minus the average uh, country. Uh, to purge, uh, to purge from the common uh, factor. So here's the statement: If you had a, any other ZT that's a weighted sum of demand changes, but the sum of the weights needs to add up to zero, uh, that's to eliminate the common uh, price elasticity. Then, uh, this, then this is a valid instrument. It has it's a valid GIV. Any other combination is also a valid GIV. It has a certain variance. But the minimum variance is achieved when the weights are precisely size minus equal weighted. Okay, so that's why uh, we propose to uh, do that uh, all the time. Uh, what if there's a, f a, a factor structure? So the weakest, the biggest threat to identification, as we see it, of a GIV is a potentially uh, ill-measured factor structure. So let me be a bit more <coughs> explicit. <coughs> Remember, YIT is the elasticity of demand uh, times of change of the price, plus idiosyncratic shock, plus this vector of aggregate shocks times some vector of uh, loading on the aggregate shock. So let's take the equal weighted version and we subtract the equal weighted uh, version from that. <coughs> we say YIT minus YET, the equal weighted sum, will be this cancels out. And then <coughs> you get eta T times the D means loading and also plus the demand uh, idiosyncratic shock okay and then so how do you handle that this is very much a factor model so you can just use a lot of knowledge from the factor models uh, estimate the lambda i the eta t and mostly estimate the residuals and uh, given that uh, those are the estimated residuals you form a giv which is the size minus equal weighted sum of the residuals from this more complicated factor model and that's how you would do it uh, in general, okay, and and again we have uh, theorems, so uh, not very complicated w once you think about it the right way. But uh, by the way, they work even with fixed n. You need large t, but even if you have uh, you know 22 countries, that's fine. A fixed number of countries, that's uh, that's uh, that's fine. Okay, so uh, so so let let let, let me finish. Uh, one, uh, one last salvo showing how we can both estimate the elasticity supply and the elasticity of demand. Okay, so here I rewrote the model going back to the uh, one, factor, one factor model uh, with uh, common loading for everybody. And this is the supply, it's the price times some elasticity uh, phi s of supply. Zt will be the size minus equal weighted uh, average demand. What are the moments? The moments I've talked so far is supply minus the elasticity times the price is orthogonal to ZT, that's true. So that identifies the supply elasticity. And then the moment for the demand will be you take the equal weighted, not size weighted, but equal weighted demand minus the elasticity times PT times PT. Add the correct elasticity of demand, that should be uncorrelated with ZT. And so that gives you 
a moment identifying uh, phi d. Okay? So that's how with the same instruments you can identify, you can identify both elasticity of demand and elasticity of uh, supply. Okay? Uh, you can also do first stage, second stage, with first you instrument the price with a z, and then you estimate those uh, uh, elasticity of supply and demand via the instrumented price, and you have lots of standard in France issues uh, and, and methods that you can uh, leverage uh, to, to get all your standard errors, etc., uh, correctly. Okay, so it's pretty simple to, to do. Basically, that's why I'm excited by the GIV. You can do that, and you can do that in a lot of cases. I, I'll explain more uh, later. Okay, so this was IV. Maybe you don't like IV so much. You can pre prefer like OLS. You can also do it via OLS, and that's what I'm going to do when I when I uh, talk about the stock market application. Come back to it. Um, another way when you have this uh, when you have this system of uh, supply and demand. Uh, oops, that's uh, here. Yeah, this is of supply and demand here. Uh, you can solve for everything, and you get that um, if you have a size weighted idiosyncratic shock, here's how it affects the aggregate supply, and here's how it affects the aggregate price via those you know, multipliers that are mixtures of supply and demand uh, elasticities. And so, just as a theorem, if you regress aggregate quantity on the GIV, you should have uh, the estimate will be your um, your multiplier over here. And if you read the price on the aggregate demand, the, the estimate will be this other mixture of elasticities. So you can also do OLS to estimate not directly the elasticities, but some interesting mixtures of those uh, elasticities. Okay? Uh, great. So now, you may worry it's a little black boxy, and we, we are uh, worried at times. Uh, so, especially when you have lots of high-frequency data, sometimes you have daily data for what all the banks do and, and look at. Uh, and so, you can do a narrative check. So, you could say, okay, uh, as the computer, computer, show me, run the GIV, and then show me the top 15 events that matter in the regression by size of idiosyncratic shocks times size of the entity, okay? And and you can look at them. You can say, okay, what happened in that year or, or in that day? And you can, um, uh, you know, this bank did, did very poorly. Was it really idiosyncratic or is it somehow reflective of a common shock? And, and maybe you've, you have a, a narrative check. So you have a narrative check and say, maybe all those shocks, we, we like them, but those other shocks, maybe it's not so clear, maybe not exactly idiosyncratic. And you just form a narratively checked GIV, which is the uh, weighted sum of those uh, of those events that pass the narrative check. And in fact, it's so fatal, typically, that if you take the top uh, 10 events, that's enough, actually, you know, for most of the identification. This way, the GIV, it adds the traditional narrative approach where you will need to know, uh, ex ante, so to speak, the important events in the world. The GIV tells you, run, the, run my GIV, I will tell you what are the, 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 the most important events, and you can go back and see whether or not they were fully uh, fully idiosyncratic, and also the GIV tells you how to control for aggregate factors, meaning purge uh, the aggregate shocks. Okay, uh, let me uh, keep track of uh, the time. Uh, and um, um, okay, um, when is it robust for identification? It's robust. Uh, it's typically quite robust, basically. Even if you may specify the sizes, basically everything that's IV is robust. Things that are uh, OLS can be a bit uh, non-robust. So if you do IV, uh, typically uh, it's going to be work well. The biggest threat to identification is maybe you didn't have a good, uh, well enough, uh, good enough factor model, uh, and uh, maybe you're missing some factors. So there are, fortunately, there's a number, battery of things you can do in those cases. You have various uh, other, identif other identification tests. Uh, you can test for a number of factors. You can do narrative GIV, or a number of things we, uh, we can do. Okay, so let me uh, not talk about that, but let me uh, go back to a motivating uh, example of finance. Okay, so what's the, uh, what's the impact if there's a 1% extra demand for stocks? What's the impact on the uh, aggregate uh, stock market? I had mentioned this five, but you know, let, let's see where, where it uh, uh, comes from. That's, that's, we developed the GIV for that. So let's call delta QI, that's the fra fractional change uh, of uh, the ownership of the equity market by institution I uh, at MT, okay? And uh, um, 
Let's imagine that all the institutions have the same elasticity of demand. You could extend the analysis with zeta i, just more complicated. So there's a change in the price. Uh, institution i changes its uh, demand by that, plus uh, some flow shock. And the flow shock uh, has an idiosyncratic component and also a systematic uh, component. Okay? So that's uh, total uh, um, JV land. And we, have, we, we, we hope we have a well enough uh, develop factor rich enough factor model so that the idiosyncratic shocks are truly uh, idiosyncratic. So then what happens? By market clearing, the size weighted sum of all the demands has to add up to zero. And as a result, with this multiplier uh, 1 over zeta, the price will be the size weighted sum of idiosyncratic shocks times the multiplier, the 5 I had uh, announced. Okay? And uh, so what do we do? For each date t, we, we do Delta QI minus the equal weighted, we apply the general JV recipe uh, that, that should have this factor structure. We run a factor model on, on, on those objects. We collect the idiosyncratic shocks and we collect their size weighted sum. And this is the instrument at MT. And as a theorem, we are allowed to regress delta PT and ZT and the uh, uh, plus maybe controls. Uh, and then M, the slope will be the impact of if there's a 1% extra uh, idiosyncratic demand shock, the impact on the price, the price goes up by M%. Percent. Okay, so that's the five I had uh, announced. So that's the, that's the plan. We do actually two analyses, by, one based on the flow of funds, that's quarterly since 1993. Uh, another one based on um, mutual funds, uh, it's monthly since also 1993. Uh, and we also have 13F data from FactSet. Anyway, I'll just show you one, one of the uh, fairly rich analysis, empirical analysis we, we, we do. So this is from the flow of funds. There are 104 so that's, uh, quarters, 26 years. So uh, the way you read, say, column one, is you regress the price on Z, the size weighted sum of idiosyncratic shocks coming from the residuals of this, uh, of this analysis. So from the large sectors in the flow of funds and on other things like GDP growth and the principal component. And the, the slope here is seven. So prima facie, it means if there's a 1% demand shock for stocks, idiosyncratic, the price of stock goes up by 7%, okay? And controlling for uh, other things. If you add one more, uh, this is one principal component, you add another principal component, then the estimate goes to five. That's where our five kind of comes from. If you added more principal components, it would still be around five, basically. Okay? And, and you can do other, other things that I want to talk about. Okay? Uh, now, you could say something very important is maybe, maybe this is a temporary blip and immediately mean reverts. Okay, that would not be very interesting. But it should not be true because we, we know that financial markets are very hard to forecast. So it's just almost impossible to imagine something would have a big blip in one quarter and mean revert next quarter. Just but uh, it's worth checking nonetheless. So the way you read this, uh, this graph is the following. There's a, an impulse response, uh, an impulse uh, GIV shock of uh, 1%, let's say, at time zero. This is the price of stocks goes up by 7% at time zero. And this is given the same shock at time zero. What's the impact of the price? cumulative impact on the price, uh, one quarter, two quarters, da, 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 four quarters later. And you see it's kind of consistent with random walk. Okay, the price doesn't particularly tend to go up or, or down on average. In the calibrated model we have, we know that the dividend price ratio mean reverts maybe with a half-life of seven years or so. So in the very long run, if I went to seven years, it would, it would mean revert a little bit, okay? But it's not visible at, with this uh, kind of, uh, at this, uh, at this uh, horizon, okay? So that's, how, um, anyway, so that's how we conclude, uh, indeed, uh, price, impact, uh, price impact of uh, you know, roughly, uh, roughly five. Okay? And there's much more uh, empirical analysis in the paper, but I want to leave it at that. How much? Uh, I have like five more. Okay, so uh, <laughs> not enough. So in the last bit uh, with uh, Gabriel schroeder reich we said, uh, and Ralph uh, Koijen, uh, we said, okay, um, this is a new paper that's not yet on the web and it's still uh, ongoing. Uh, how do we move from one market, the market for oil, the market for stocks versus bonds, to like all the markets in the world, why not, uh, using, a, using a GIV, okay? So we have a network that features potentially many markets and the whole economy. How would you do 
whole international macro or domestic macro with n sectors with, uh, with, this, kind of, uh, with this kind of view. So we propose a simple way uh, to do that. So the, 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 the core idea is what I showed you, but now it's much, we have a, a much richer setup. So there's a vector of, so here's the, there's a vector of outcomes. If you had n sectors, uh, it would be the growth rates uh, or the quantity of all sectors, or maybe also over prices, okay? Uh, large vector YT, and it depends what sector I does, depend on what happens to sector J's, okay? maybe TFP spillovers or demand uh, spillovers. There are some matrix B of gamma. Gamma will be a, a low dimensional vector of parameters, maybe five parameters or 10 parameters to identify. B will typically be some sort of nonlinear function via a structural model. It could also depend if you have, say, sticky prices on what happened in the previous period. And then there's idiosyncratic shocks and also uh, a vector of aggregate shocks. Okay? So this is uh, like GIV like, except again, it's not like one market. We can have you know, 60 markets or 120 countries, et cetera, uh, slash, slash market. Uh, it's useful to imagine. Uh, so let's imagine this is a distraction. This is useful in practice, but in, in theory, it's a bit of a banal distraction. So let's imagine it's not there. Uh, so then you can rewrite a YT will depend on UT, the rate shock, times this matrix A of gamma, that depends on the rest. And so we want to identify gamma via, if there's an additional shock to Apple, you can see how it ripples, affects the whole rest of the economy. It we should affect it with its A of gamma matrix, so you use that to, uh, to identify gamma intuitively, okay? So let me give you three examples, I'll take a little more time, just, uh, 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 but not as much as the Russia, uh, um, uh, okay, uh, war, so uh, don't worry. Um, okay, so three, three little examples, so that is not like econometrics, just, so suppose you have social networks. My YIT will depend on what the other people do, YJT, with some non-metric GIJ, so maybe it's who I follow on Twitter or something like that with their influence. Uh, Times the vector, times the parameter gamma that I don't know. So I, want, I know the links, but I don't know how influential they are. They're parameterized by this little gamma. So that fits in our uh, framework. So it could be why it is the TFP shock. How do we have TFP shocks uh, spill over via, you know, rumor like uh, externalities or something like that? Um, and uh, uh, what if you don't know the, the, the right matrix? You could have a size weighted sum of different matrices. That's okay too. The model is. Uh, flexible enough to uh, look, uh, allow for that. Uh, you can also uh, supply and demand, a good old supply and demand also works there. Uh, quantity depends on the price, the price depends on all the quantities. That's also a system where, you know, this vector of quantity and prices depend on the other vector of quantity of prices. There's a B of gamma that encodes, um, you know, demand elasticities and supply elasticities, okay? And, and this is what the little gamma parameter would be to identify those, uh, those things. And we can, by the way, identify, uh, have heterogeneous demand, uh, demand elasticities. Another one is we want to do dynamic macro. So we want to do dynamic macro uh, just inside, say, uh, you know, the US or the EU, and also just to do international macro. Uh, it turns out that existing models are very useful but special. So the, the star, like almost always in economics, is, long, is uh, called Douglas, so that's a long plus a model. Uh, the static version is called uh, Asemoglu et al. Uh, and, uh, um, but but you, we know elasticities are not, co are not cop de glass, so we, we, did, we wrote a new model of macro networks with, with different goods have different elasticities, much more flexible, and we have n sectors, it's quite, uh, quite flexible, uh, but still uh, tractable. Um, and so what you get out of that is you get results like the change in the price depends on my productivity shock, but also the change in the price of my inputs, like in almost any input output model, but also depending uh, if my marginal cost is not constant on the quantity I produce with the supply elasticity. And also my demand depends on the demand, uh, depend on, on, on uh, my, my price with an elasticity of demand, uh, and also the demand from the other sectors. Uh, and uh, this is, if you have no pricing friction, if you have pricing friction, that is basically the same except you have lags depending on the uh, speed of the price changes. But the key thing, is, it's all worked out in the paper, is that it has the same shape, where YIT, a big vector of pr change in prices and changes in quantities, depends on its current values and potentially its lagged values via uh, 
slow adjustment of prices, and uh, common shocks and idiosyncratic shocks. And the, the, the vision here, if you want, is using those idiosyncratic shocks, wh when the productivity shock by Apple, how does it ripple to its suppliers and consumers? As an idiosyncratic demand shock by Apple, how does it reply to, uh, ripple to suppliers, consumers, maybe workers also? Uh, you can identify a lot of that. So uh, how do we do that? Let uh, me just give you, again, the spirit is we extract idiosyncratic shocks, we see how they ripple. Uh, it turns out that, well, that's, those are just words, you want to do it in practice. Uh, let me probably uh, not go, well, I'll tell you just a little bit. The way we do it, we say, look, suppose God somehow had given us the, all the idiosyncratic shocks. And in equilibrium, when we know the gamma, we know the idiosyncratic shocks. Then uh, we look, uh, we, we take from I, and we look at all the other shocks that are not from I, or of, of all the other firms. And we say, this is what happens to aggregate GDP if you add all the shocks to all the other firms except the shock to firm I. And we say, how does that, how do all the firms from the all the other, uh, how do all the shocks from the all the other firms, how do they affect firm I? Okay, this is how they should affect it. And we want to uh, best explain that by minimizing uh, this gamma parameter. And then we find the following, uh, we find the following, um, the following moment, and this is more an inspiration. Uh, once we do that, we have a systematic procedure where, given a guess for gamma, we get the idiosyncratic shocks, and then we say, let's um, in the, at the correct value of gamma, those idiosyncratic shocks of all the other firms should best explain what happens to firm I. Okay, uh, and then you have a derivative of matrix with respect to gamma that, that's here. Uh, we have theorems, the German moment holds. Uh, we have conditions under which this is optimal. More importantly, we also have uh, we can derive uh, how, good the how good the precision is, and it's actually very good. And this is, let me just uh, summarize in words all this um, messy looking uh, econometrics. Suppose you take the, the simplest model with just one linear uh, influence ve vector. If a traditional GIV, the standards were proportional to one over square root of t. But if it's network GIV, it's proportional to one over square root of n times t. So it's much faster, and, uh, and so you can use both uh, cross time series and cross sectional variation for that. And basically, you say, uh, intuitively, it's, you look at Apple, how it ripples through all its supply chain. You can look at Walmart, how it ripples through all its supply chain. You can look at some other, I don't know, Ford how it ripples through all its supply checks. So you have all these n sources of variation, in some sense, that matter. And, and, uh, and, and so in this era where we are of uh, you know, big data set, often you know, they have a very big cross-section with lots of uh, observations, but fairly shallow time series, um, time series depth. Uh, but then in principle, you can do this DIV and get a still very, very high precision because a large cross-section compensates, in some sense, for shallow uh, time series. So that's part of why we're very uh, helpful. Anyway, it's almost like the MLE. Uh, you can do lots of things, interpret, etc., etc. Let me, uh, you can do lots of extensions with many lags. You can have uh, common factors and we have theorems and simulations for all those things. Uh, I don't have yet uh, data to show you because, uh, I don't, you know, programming takes, is, is, takes longer sometimes or often than one expects. But I have math and the vision, so maybe it's, uh, math and the vision is better than data. So at least in, in, in Ethereum, in the Ethereum, okay, in terms of long run um, generativeness. Anyway, uh, so, so what's the kind of you know vision if you want? Yeah, if Apple has a productivity shock, what's the impact on the supplier, on the producers' quantity and the prices and their TFP and the workers? All sorts of basic questions like that that all link to some elasticities. Uh, rumor like externalities of TFSP, uh, spillovers, maybe learning spillovers. In principle, you can handle that with this kind of uh, uh, granular IV. And again, you will aggregate together the shocks to Apple, the shocks to IBM, the shocks to GM, etc. etc. Uh, there's a nice literature on how does inflation propagate through production networks. Uh, so those are some of the nice papers. And often they look at just Okay, what happens to oil shocks? If you have an oil shock, how it propagates through the production network is a really, really, really nice paper. Paper, And here you can look at that for all the commodities, any idiosyncratic shocks to any commodity, 
how it propagates for a network, and then the kind of um, uh, dry work we've done on optimally aggregation of all those shocks. Uh, will tell you here's a, a way to derive an estimator that, that will optimally aggregate all of those uh, things. Uh, the missing is a problem in Baltic. Uh, if there's a China shock that affects some states more than others, how does it affect the aggregate? You can also do it with the GIV, and, and I won't have the time to show you how, but in, princip in principle, uh, you can do it and you have uh, shocks all the time. Uh, payoff in international macro. Likewise, you could say if there's a shock to TV shock to uh, real estate, negative real estate shock to China uh, that then affects the financial sector and presumably um, ability to export and the like, so our demand for German machine tools. What's the impact on the aggregate economy via impact on Germany and the impact from Germany to uh, Czech, Czech Republic and whatnot? Uh, via this kind of network GIV with an with international uh, input output matrix and a, and a model putting all those things in a sensible uh, manner. Uh, you can look at the impact of shocks on GDPs, world well, GD, shocks on a given country, GDPs, exchange rate, inflation, and, and the like. And you could do also regional macro. Like in Europe, we like to also have regional macro. If there's uh, a new um, uh, you know, gigafactory uh, near Barcelona, what happens to uh, you know, TFP of other firms and employment and wages in other firms? In principle, you can do uh, all that. When I say in principle, I mean, we are here, you know, before it was very unclear how you would even uh, identify any of those parameters, where here you have a fairly systematic way uh, to do it using those uh, idiosyncratic shocks. Uh, you can also do uh, international finance. And once you see markets are inelastic, so you buy a bit of equities, boom, the equity market goes up. Uh, we don't have a direct quantification, but we suspect the, uh, it's even much worse uh, for, the, uh, uh, for exchange rates. It's even much more inelastic. And actually, there's a paper by uh, Kamano, uh, Hélène, Hélène Ray, uh, and Ho, uh, documenting that now we're using a GIV uh, strategy. Uh, you can do quantitative easing for various assets. You know, what should the ECB do? Buy those bonds or those bonds? Well, what matters is how much you will affect their price and their price affect the investment. Again, with the GIV strategy, you can uh, identify that. Potentially, it could help for some of the deepest, uh, most uh, annoying problems of macro, uh, or deepest in the sense of you know, inaccessible, you know, what is our star, okay? So uh, where does it come from in the first place? So uh, the longer run is interest rate. So, if you have idiosyncratic shocks of, of savings from country I to country J, in principle, that changes the Ethereum uh, real interest rate in this uh, country J. And uh, you can see how it changes consumption, investment, and the like. And potentially, you can get a sense what the uh, uh, you know, interest rate sensitivity of supply and demand for loans and, and get out of the R star. We, we have notes on that, but we're not doing it directly. Anyway. Um, you can also recover a new way to recover TFP shocks, much better, uh, di very different from Blanchard-Croix, basically, and Solo via, uh, via the network GIV. Again, uh, um, the physical idea is supply shocks that tend to propagate downwards, uh, demand shocks that tend to propagate upwards in the, in the supply chain. And we have theorems saying, in principle, that allows you to identify those things and simulations showing it. It also works in practice, so to speak. Uh, anyway, so let me, uh, let me conclude. As you see, I'm quite excited by <laughs> the possibility of, of doing I feel, very, I feel like a useful person uh, for, for, practical, uh, for practical economics with uh, you know, numbers and everything. Uh, uh, with this uh, old now, but uh, revamped granular idea. Uh, how do firm specific hiring investments spill over to other firms? That's the common no horror paper I mentioned. How, if, if you suddenly want to buy in the Turkish lira, what happens to the Turkish lira? And potentially that's what they did. And what happens then to, um, you know, to trade and investment and exports in Turkey? They didn't do that. It's uh, ripe for the taking. What's the impact of the increase in concentration? You can do GV and Hofindals and other things. Uh, if you want, there's a paper on that. Uh, and, and lots of things that potentially you can do. Anyway, conclusion, uh, I wanted to convey two things of, uh, that excite me these days. Uh, one is uh, where do financial fluctuations come from, not just plain macro fluctuations. Uh, maybe uh, flows in uh, markets are very inelastic because people are very just inattentive in general. So it's, a, I think, a useful part of, of enrichment in behavioral uh, macro finance. And as a result, 
uh, flows have a big impact on, on prices, even in the very uh, long run, and, and risk premium and investment down the road. Uh, and, and the GIV, at the end, it's a very simple idea, uh, but with potentially many applications, there are some kind of non-trivial thinking involved to, on how to optimally aggregate them. You can estimate new things, you can have uh, it's a step towards systematically constru constructing instruments. It lowers the need for finding unique one-off events like a China shock that, is, that are obsolete five years later. Um, and you can do network, uh, this network GIV could be useful to do international macro, international macro, regional macro in Europe with various regions. And, and with all those new nice data sets with all sector linkage and all that, now you can also use that to do actually structural economics with causality, and so that's uh, useful uh, also in trade and perhaps uh, and the like. Anyway, so I think the future of macrofinance is bright. Uh, we have more sensible and more intuitive models than, say, you know, the consumption cap I mean, the, the, the stocks depend on the covariance of marginal utility, which nobody, re you know, nobody reasons like that. Uh, there's a behavioral component here. And uh, you have policy consequences on here's what the central bank should, the assets the central bank should buy, uh, buy and sell. Those are, are less, uh, less uh, elastic, basically, and, and more related to investment. You can quantify those things. And you can estimate all that causally, with, uh, in particular in big disaggregated data sets, with its kind of structure, even for very general economies. So I think there's a lot to do, both a bit in theory and also in, uh, in Apurex. Uh, thank you very much. Xavier is excited. There's a lot of interesting ideas. The future is bright, but we're running out of time. I encourage anyone who has questions to come up to Xavier and uh, uh, talk about it here. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining.